uh, all right. So my name is Martin Palikan, and in this tutorial, I'm going to talk about probabilistic model building genetic algorithms. Uh, over the last few decades, genetic and evolutionary algorithms have become very popular. And probably the most important reason for this is, is that they are very easy to understand. You don't have to be a specialist in the field to know how genetic algorithm works or how evolution strategy works. And they're also very easy to implement and apply to, to, to a real world problem. You only have to design some very uh, general representation. You only have to implement some kind of a fitness function and you can apply some of the available genetic algorithm codes or evolution strategy codes to the problem very easily. So that's why many people started to use these methods. And when you start with a uh, genetic algorithm or evolution strategy, probably the first thing that you would do is download some, some kind of code from, from the internet or implement some simple genetic algorithm and try it on some very simple problem. So you would try it on a 50-bit uh, one max problem or a 10 variable sphere problem. And you would find out that it works really great. If you use a population of size 50 or 100 or 200, it's just working. If you try the crossover probability of 0.1 or 0.5 or 0.9, it's still working. If you try two-point crossover, uniform crossover, it's still working. If you try all kinds of uh, self-adaptive mutation strategies or you actually set the step size to some fixed value, it still keeps working very well, right? And the initial impression is amazing. But then you come to a more difficult problem and you find out that when you take a real-world problem and you implement your actual fitness function, which is for your much more difficult real-world problem, which maybe contains 500 variables and is highly multimodal, then you find out that the things do not work so well anymore. And what you oftentimes have to do is, say, tune parameters. So you find out that I can no longer use a population of size 50, I can no longer use a crossover probability this and that, and I have to actually tune parameters to make it work. Sometimes even that is not enough, and that's why there are a lot of papers uh, where people change representations, where people change operators, and you find out that you have to, uh, say, reorder bits in your solution strings so that actually your two-point crossover is going to work. Or you find out that you actually cannot use the representation for uh, telecommunication networks based on prefer numbers. You can actually, you, you, you have to actually use different types of representation to make things work. And this is what leads the users many times to change representations, to change operators to better fit the problem. And in this tutorial, I'm going to talk about one approach where we can take some of this work from the practitioner and make the algorithm actually do that. So instead of making the user to somehow make the problem fit the algorithm or design specific operators that actually fit my specific problem, I'm going to talk about approaches which can, which, which, which can automatically adapt to the problem. So which, which can somehow by themselves figure out how the problem landscape looks like, and which can by themselves kind of adapt their operators to, to more quickly solve difficult problems. And this is going to be done by combining machine learning and uh, genetic and evolutionary algorithms, uh, specifically probably genetic algorithms are the closest area of optimization techniques, but also evolution strategies. So we will see combination of techniques from genetic and evolutionary algorithms and machine learning, specifically probabilistic modeling. I'm going to start by motivating the use of probabilistic models in black box optimization, and I'm going to talk about uh, how, how we can replace some of the typical operators in genetic algorithms by building and sampling a probabilistic model of promising solutions. And then I'm going to go through an overview of what we call probabilistic model building genetic algorithms or estimation of distribution algorithms, which are based on this principle. And most of the talk will be based on the discrete representation where I'm going to talk about binary strings or other finite alphabets, but we will talk a little bit about real value vectors, genetic programming representations, and, and other types of PMDGAs. And finally, I'm going to try to conclude the talk and argue what I think are the most important lessons here. If we take a general optimization problem, we could call it white box optimization problem, one way to define it in a very flexible manner is to specify two things. First of all, how do my potential or candidate solutions look like? So I, for example, say that I'm trying to find a solution which is going to be a 50 
uh, component real valued vector where each of those component variables is going to be from interval 0, 1, or I'm going to deal with uh, 100 decision variables so I can actually represent my problem by 100 bit binary strings where each of these bits will decide yes or no, will make one of those decisions. And then I have some kind of a measure which lets me decide which of these solutions are better and which of these solutions are worse. And this can be a function that I apply to my solution strings and it gives me a real value and I would like to maximize this real value. But I don't really have to have a computable function. I can also have a function which lets me choose out of two solutions that I provided it lets me choose which one of them is better, which one of them is worse. So I can really have a partial ordering over that solution space. And my question would be, well, what's the best solution out of all these candidate solutions, the solution that evaluates the best out of these candidate solutions? Sometimes I would like to find more of those guys. Sometimes I would just like to find one. Sometimes I don't care so much if I'm completely there, and I would just like to approximate my optimum. But this is the general question that we are asking. What's important is that, is, is, is that we do not really know much more about the problem if we define the problem in this way. So we do not know if candidate solutions uh, represent the shape of an air, aircraft wing or they represent a chess strategy. We just know that we have those candidate solutions represented in this specific way and we can evaluate them. But we do not really know what they represent and how they relate, how the semantics of candidate solutions relates to uh, to the evaluation function. And this is a certain, uh, certain advantages. If I uh, define the problem in this way, it makes it very easy for me to apply the algorithm to a new problem without having to change the problem too much. I talked about that at the beginning, that one of the reasons why genetic algorithms are so popular is that they can be applied to all kinds of problems in a very easy way. I just find a way to represent my problem as a a binary string or real valued vector, some kind of combination of these things. I just implement the fitness function, I can run my code. I don't have to map the problem into a linear programming problem. I don't have to map my problem into a quadratic assignment problem. That's what makes it very easy to apply these methods in practice. But at the same time, it creates it very difficult for the algorithm itself because the algorithm does not really know how the fitness function looks like, how the fitness function relates to my uh, problem representation and that makes it very difficult to solve these problems efficiently. If I knew that the problem is a linear problem, I can solve it very quickly. If I have no clue what the problem looks like and it can be anything from a completely randomly generated landscape all the way to linear problems, it's actually very difficult to find a way to solve these kinds of problems in general in an efficient manner. Right? And there are no free lunch theorems which support this. It's very difficult to approach general class of problems. And if we do not make any restrictions, of course, we are not going to vote for anything better than random search. But if we do make uh, very flexible restrictions, we are actually going to be able to solve very broad class of problems efficiently. And I'm going to argue about that. Anyway, I'm going to talk about a bunch of different representations. I'm going to start with binary strings because it's easiest to, uh, to talk about and probably most of the research uh, was done in this area as well. And then I'm going to look at other representations as well. And I'm going to talk about solving these types of problems with probabilistic modeling, as I said. Anyway, so uh, let's say we have an optimization algorithm that tries to solve those kinds of problems that I just defined. Uh, since the algorithm does not have any knowledge about the problem, it just, it, it just knows how the candidate solutions look like and it just has the evaluation function. The only thing it can do to learn about the problem is to generate some of those solutions and evaluate them. And once I do this, I do have some information about the problem. So in this case, my solutions would be, of course, a trivial example, right? But my solutions would be five <coughs> binary strings I can generate uh, four of those guys, I can uh, evaluate all of those guys and say I want to maximize that evaluation function. This gives me some information about the problem. And I could, for example, notice that all well, the guys who evaluate pretty well have actually a lot of ones in them. Right? I can notice certain regularities about how, how the solutions look like and how it relates to the fitness function. I can uh, look at these things and then I can decide, well, what solutions should I generate next, right? That's my question. And I'm going to keep generating new and new solutions, add those solutions into my set of evaluated solutions, and I'm going to make decisions, well, 
where should I look next? The best place to look next would be, of course, the global optimum, right? But generally, I cannot look into the global optimum, but I can actually increase probability of generating high quality solutions for certain types of problems if I do things well, and if I do my job well in exploiting that information that I obtain. And that's the question that uh, pretty much all these optimization methods are trying to answer. And the important thing to say here is that typically my solution space, of course, is very, very large. And I really want to look into a very, very small fraction of that space. And I want to be pretty darn sure that I actually found the global optimum. Right? So that's the game that we are playing here. Uh, in very few cases, you can actually go the total enumeration. And that's, that's even if you have uh, good branch and bound methods, you're typically restricted to very small problems of several tens of bits, maybe in the binary domain, maybe hundreds of bits. Anyway. There are many ways to do this. Uh, if you look at the hill climber, it makes some walk through the search space, starts in a random point, and then goes through the neighborhood. It always generates the solution in the neighborhood of the best so far point, because it thinks that the neighborhood of the best so far point is actually a pretty likely area to contain good solutions. Right? So that's the basic idea of the hill climbing. Simulated annealing would introduce metropolis criterion and would be able to escape some of the local optima a little bit better. Uh, probabilistic model building GAs, that's what I'm going to talk about here, use probabilistic modeling. So what probabilistic model building GAs will do, they will look at our points that we generated so far. They will take the best of those points, which represent kind of the area where we would um, be looking for other good points. And then they will use a probabilistic model of those good points to generate new points that we believe. <coughs> so the work will really go into building the probabilistic model and sampling the model. The general scheme, but we can of course modify this a little bit back and forth. But the basic idea of a probabilistic model building GA is very similar as, as a standard genetic algorithm. So we would work with a population of points. You can actually go without the population of points, but this is kind of a simple idea, so I just want to get something in. Uh, we would work with the population of points, then we could implement some selection strategy of genetic algorithms, like truncation selection in this case, where we would just cut the worst half of the population based on my fitness function, and we would keep the best guys. And then, Cross, um, a standard genetic algorithm would apply crossover and mutation, but here I'm going to instead build a probabilistic model of those selected solutions. And then instead of, again, applying those crossover and mutation, I'm going to sample the probabilistic model to generate new solutions. So I, in a simple way, I can say that I'm replacing crossover and mutation by building a probabilistic and explicit probabilistic model of my selected solutions and then sampling the model to generate new solutions. Notice that when I sample the model, I'm not uh, using my old solutions anymore. I expect my model to actually encode all important features of those good solutions that I have found by selection. Right? Once I generate the new solutions, I would repeat this. And what I would expect is that the probabilistic model should, uh, should encode uh, probability distribution over candidate solutions, which will generate better solutions more likely over time, right? So, and eventually, if the things were great, and that's the ideal case, after 55 generations or so, my probabilistic model should encode the model of the global optima, right? I would expect it to generate all my global optima, and that would be the ideal case, which, of course, doesn't happen always. Uh, there are other names for uh, for probabilistic model building GAs, which basically mean the same thing. So if you see estimation of distribution algorithms or iterated density estimation algorithms, those terms basically refer to the same thing. So those are pretty much synonyms. Anyway, I'm going to start with a very simple example. This example is going to lead us to, lead, lead us to some of the difficulties which actually uh, provided source of problems for for initial few years of research in PMDGAs, and then I'm going to look at uh, more complicated algorithms with more complicated probabilistic models which try to resolve these difficulties. And as I said, then we will go up uh, and, and look at other representations. 
So the first simple example is going to work with n-bit binary strings, the same kind of setup as a simple genetic algorithm, pretty much. And as a probabilistic model, you're going to use the so-called probability vector, <coughs> which encodes a probability of one in every single string position. So for all these n positions, we are going to encode what's the probability of seeing a one in that specific position. A very simple model which completely ignores the context of any bit. Notice that sometimes it might be good to have one in the second position only if there is one in the first position, right? And otherwise, the better value would really be a zero, right? Here we ignore context completely and just look what's the proportion of ones for the different string positions. And this is kind of how it works. And again, I simplify very much, right? We look at very small solutions, but we would uh, work with the population of points generated probably randomly at the beginning. Then I would do my selection, for example, truncation selection. And then what I would do, I would like learn the probabilistic model, my probability vector. And in this case, that would consider of, uh, of computing what's the proportion of one in every single position of my solution strings, right? So in this simple case, I see that there are 100% of ones in the first position, there are 50% of ones in the second position, and so on and so forth, right? So I just go through my solution points and I compute the proportion of ones for every position, and then I would generate new points by preserving those proportions. So if I saw in my selected set of solutions that there are 100% of ones, I would generate 100% of ones for that position. If I see that there are 10% of ones, I would generate 10% of ones. So I expect that proportions of ones in my generated population of points are exactly the same as the proportion of ones uh, <coughs> after my selection operator, right? I completely ignore context. So if I had solutions which uh, would look like 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, and 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, that would encode me a uniform distribution because I would have a 50-50 probability of generating 1 or 0. And I would actually generate a random population of points. I completely ignore the context of each bit, but that's maybe something we should talk about later. But this is the basic idea. Note that any kind of crossover in genetic algorithm or most crossover operators actually do the same thing. They preserve the proportions of ones in every position precisely well. And they only mix the bits a little bit up. Here I mix the bits very strongly. Uh, this is uh, something very similar to uniform crossover or something very similar to multiple applications of any, any crossover operator. If I apply any crossover operator infinitely many times, typically I would get this kind of result. Anyway, but that's not too much detail. There are several uh, PMBGAs or EDAs that are based on this principle. Here is the list of them. There are, of course, slight differences in how these algorithms deal with the population of points, how they deal with updates of the model. But more or less, the idea is the same. They use the probability vector, and the probability vector is used to guide my search for the <coughs> So what should happen? Well, when I apply this kind of algorithm to my problem, I would expect the bits that perform better than their competitors to actually increase in proportion, right? So if for the first position, if solutions that have a one there actually on average perform better than solutions that have a zero there, I would increase once to increase in proportion for that position. If in the second position I find out that actually zeros perform better on average than ones, I would expect proportions of ones to actually go down. And I would expect this probability vector to incrementally reflect these relationships, right? So I would expect the bits that are better to increase in proportion, the bits that perform worse to decrease in proportion. That's what I would expect to happen. And we can visualize how this actually happens on a one max, which is a very simple problem. It's a linear problem where the thickness is equal to the sum of all the bits. So the maximum thickness is actually the number, total number of the bits in a problem, and I would like to find the solution with all ones, right? With the thickness of n. That's the problem. So the more ones, the better the solution string. And by the way, what we would expect is that since more ones mean better thickness, we would increase those proportions of ones to increase over time, right? So we would expect those probability vector ent entries to keep increasing. They would start at 0.5, because initially I started with random solutions, would expect them to increase incrementally over time. 
And if you actually run it, and this is a simple MATLAB simulation of the algorithm that I just described with uh, 100-bit one max problem, and uh, it's uh, using, I think, population size of 100 as well, trying to, try to keep things simple. And we see that the probability vector entries start at 0.5, and they keep changing over time. Right? Sometimes they go a little bit down, sometimes they go up, but overall, pretty much all the probability vector entries reach 1. Because simply solutions with more ones perform better. So we would expect those ones to increase in proportion over time. And we would expect eventually to be generating only my global optimum in the string of all months. In about, I don't know, 22, 23 generations, my probability vector is simply going to be a vector of 100% probabilities and I'm going to just generate the optimum. So everything worked great. It worked very quickly. We can actually look theory that exists for uh, these algorithms and we can actually say that uh, we are going to be able to solve one max and similar linear problems that look like this in about n log n evaluations where n is the number of bits in my problem. So I have near linear performance which is of course really great. And I have it if I set my population size well according to the Gumbler's ruin model and if I wait uh, long enough as many generations as I need to actually reach optimum with, with uh, high probability and that's going to again lead to n log n evaluations which is very good performance. But in this case pretty much all other algorithms that we can apply will work very well. It's a very simple problem and I can apply uh, hill climbing with bit flip mutation, I can apply, and there is theory for that, and I'm going to get n log n evaluations, I can apply GAs with uniform or one point crossover, and all of these methods are going to work very well. <coughs> Genetic algorithms are not going to work as well because they combine solutions a little bit slower, but they're still going to work very well. And if you apply it to one max pretty much any algorithm, you will get very, very good performance. So it's no big deal that we solve that kind of a problem with a PNBGA, but we still do, and that's kind of how it works, right? So we get the basic idea that the models should improve over time with respect to the expected fitness of the solutions that we are generating. That's the simple way to define it. <coughs> now to uh, show where these kinds of algorithms fail, I'm going to use a concatenated trap problem, which uh, most of you probably have heard of. Where the basic problem is defined as a sum of subproblems of bounded order. In this case, I'm going to split my solution strings in, in, uh, in, into groups of five bits, five bits each. And to each of those groups of five bits, I'm going to apply the so-called trap function, which looks like this. And it has the optimum in uh, the string of five ones, which is five, and it is a local optimum in the string of uh, all zeros, right? So it is the global optimum in the string of all ones, local optimum in the string of all zeros, and uh, my overall fitness function will be the sum of these sub-functions of order five, right? So it's a simple function, it is sum of some relatively simple small functions. Uh, this is how it looks like, one of those traps, but again I'm summing up a number of those traps for those subsets of bits. So the global optimum is in the string of all ones. And I would expect my graph to look something like it looked before, because I know that my global optimum is still in the string of all ones. But what happens for this problem is when I apply my UMDA with the same setup as I used before, suddenly what I get is, is, is exactly the opposite performance. And it's, um, I would like the proportions of ones to increase over time and actually not one of them, not five of them, but all of them actually decrease over time. And the algorithm seems to go exactly in the wrong direction. Now, one may think that, well, maybe you just did not set a good enough population size, right? So maybe I should have used a population size of 500. It would not change the thing at all. Even if I used an infinite population and I made a numeric simulation of what would be happening, the thing would just more stably go down. Because there is something fundamentally wrong with the model for this specific problem. And what's wrong is that that model ignored context of every bit. And for this specific problem, if we ignore context of every bit, you're just going to go in the wrong direction. <coughs> right? So what I try to show here is a problem for which such a simple model does not actually look like. And uh, 
If you look at it more uh, deeply, we will notice that even if you take just one of those traps, if you don't take that sum of multiple trap functions, and if you look at the uh, average <coughs> fitness of solutions with a zero in one position, and the average fitness with solution of solutions with a one in that position, I find out that actually on average zero is better. It's not actually globally better, because the optimum is in the string one, 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 right? The point is that on average actually zero looks better. And that's why, because of the same argument why everything worked great on one max, everything works horribly on trap problems. Same average fitnesses would be obtained if I look at the sum of multiple traps, because all other traps are going to average out, basically. Right? So the problem is that my algorithm ignores context of every bit, and if I look at every bit independently of other bits, things are not going to go in the right direction, and I'm not going to be able to solve the problem. Now, we may say, why do I care about trap problems? Well, the point is that for many problems, we can expect that the context actually is going to matter. Only if the problem is linear, I can say I don't care about the context. Anytime the problem is actually more complex than a linear problem, I have to be able to take into account context. Otherwise, I'm not going to be able to guarantee that I find, find a global output. And I can create many non-linear problems which are easy to solve still, but it does not matter that I'm going to be able to guarantee that for those kinds of problems I'm going to actually be able to solve them. Anyway, one of the questions is, well, can we make a PMBGA that actually does this? And I'm going to show how we can cheat a little bit, and by knowing how the problem looks like, how we can create a specific type of a model which is going to solve the problem just as well as UMDA or the probability vector-based EDA was able to solve one max problem. And the basic idea is that instead of looking at the probabilities of single bits, we are going to look at probabilities of groups of bits. And we are going to look at the group of bits corresponding to every single traps in those concatenated trap functions as this one single chunk of bits. And we are going to encode 32 probabilities or proportions for all different ways of instantiating those five bits. Right? So we can set five bits in 32 different ways. And I'm going to compute from my selected points 32 proportions. And then I'm going to generate my new points by generating five bits at a time using these proportions. Right? So I have five times less different statistics, but all of them will contain 32 values instead of one, or 30 bad values. And if I do that, my probability vector entries, in this case it's not actually probability vector, but my probability entries of, of, of the, and, and I'm only looking at 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, because that's my globally optimal uh, instantiation of bits, and I'm looking at proportions of these chunks of bits, and they start <laughs> at 1 over uh, 32, right? So they start the very low, 1 over 32, uh, because there are 5 bits, right, and the probability of generating 1, 1, 1, 1, 1 is 1 over 32, which is I don't know how much, but anyway, what we get is increasing proportion of those things that I really want to increase the proportion of, and everything seems to work great. And again, 20-something generations, and I get the distribution that actually generates me only the global optimum. Right, so the thing actually works very well. If I manage to find the statistics that lead to the optimum, things are going to work very well. That's the argument, right? And what we did in this case, we managed to make sure that uh, for every bit, I take into account the context of that bit that actually does matter for that bit, right? Because I know for traps that if everybody else is zero, then a zero works best. But if everybody else is one, then one work, works best, right? So I made sure that I take into account the context of every bit, and by doing that, I was able to solve the problem very efficiently. And we can, again, apply a similar theory that we would have applied in the previous case, and uh, we can find out that we will, again, use n log n evaluations to actually solve these problems, which is, again, near linear performance, which is, again, great performance. But in this case, if you look at other algorithms that we could apply, the climber, it's going to suddenly take n to the 5 log n evaluations, which is n to the 4 times more. And if n is equal to 1,000, that actually 
quite a few times more than it was before. And in general case, if my uh, statistics that I need to take into account were of order k, put <coughs> them into the k log n. And even for n equal 5, you will actually notice if you make a simulation, and I've done these simulations for the class that I teach, you will find out that you can really solve only very small problems if you have complexity of n to the 5 something. Uh, even more situation happens with genetic algorithms with uniform crossover or standard crossover operators where if we do not assume that the bits in each trap are very close to each other in my solution strings, I'm going to get exponential performance. And that's even worse. And you will find out that you can really solve only problems of maybe 15 or 20 bits and that's it. Right? So that's a very bad performance. So suddenly we are doing better than many other standard evolutionary algorithms, the question is, of course, well, how, how do we make it not cheat and make it discover that model that I decided to use automatically, right? So how do I make my PMBGA to figure out, well, now probability vector is not enough, I should actually use the model which uses those five-bit statistics, right? So that's my question right now. How do I make my algorithm to figure out what kind of statistics it should use to succeed? Uh, and this leads us to a challenge. Can we actually design a probabilistic model building genetic algorithm that is going to be able to find those statistics, that is going to be able to find the important context for each single bit, which is going to determine which values of this bit would be preferable in those different contexts, and which is going to allow me that I'm going to have uh, some low order polynomial performance and I'm going to relax it a little bit because n log n is not always the case for even, even for linear problems and I'm going to say that I would like to solve the problem in a quadratic number of evaluations or better. Right? So can we make an algorithm which is not going to grow as n to the k or which is not going to grow exponentially fast but which is going to automatically be able to find out what statistics to use and then it's going to use them to solve the problem efficiently, just like we saw in these examples. And this is the challenge that uh, researchers in EDAs tried to solve for some years, and some of the first ideas were uh, the so-called tree models, which are very popular in machine learning because they're very easy to learn. They can be learned in uh, quadratic time, and that there are methods that can learn those models very efficiently, even for uh, really highly dimensional spaces, and so on and so forth. Then I'm going to talk about the extended compact genetic algorithm, which is going to be very similar to our cheat that I just presented. So it's going to be able to learn those kinds of models that have those subsets of variables as individual statistics. And then I'm going to talk about the Bayesian <coughs> optimization algorithm, which uses Bayesian networks for this. So the basic idea in Comet is to use a tree model where we would arrange my bits or string positions in a tree. And in that tree, for every node except for the root, the, the probabilities of the bit, of the specific bit, would depend on the value of the parent of that bit. Right? So I would be able to encode for every bit a context of one other bit that would actually matter. So I would say that, well, the probability of this bit being a zero, uh, or let me say probability of this bit being one, given that uh, the previous bit is zero, is actually 30%, and probability of it being a one would be 70% in that context, right? So for every bit, I would be able to store one other variable that really matters, except for the root, of course, which would be generated with the standard univariate probability. Right? That guy does not depend on anything directly, but others depend on it. So this is the simple idea how to actually include some context. We do not include context of more variables. In a tree, every node can have only one parent. Right? So we can only encode context of one other bit, but we can do that. And we can very easily learn these kinds of models. All we have to do is compute the so-called um, uh, mutual information between the pairs of variables, which is defined as is shown here. And I'm not going to talk about the, uh, the details of this, but we can compute mutual information, which uh, more or less basically says how, how, how much information does one bit provide about the value of the other bit, right? That's kind of what the measure provides. 
And then what we would like to find is a tree which is going to maximize the mutual information between the connected bits. And that can be done with the simple Prince algorithm. And uh, if we do this, we can uh, claim that the tree that we have found will actually minimize the kullback leibler divergence between the actual distribution of points and the learned model that I actually estimated. So we can say that it's from one perspective that the model is actually the best tree model that I actually can find. Uh, the Prince algorithm would start with a graph with no edges, then it would start in a random node, and then it would keep adding the nodes which uh, would be connected by highest mutual information to already added nodes, right? So we would keep growing the tree by adding the biggest edges that we can actually add at a time to make the tree. Always add one more thing to the tree, it would be a quadratic algorithm, and it would guarantee me that I find the globally optimal tree model in all cases. It's a very quick algorithm, as I said. There are other algorithms that we can use if the uh, space is uh, very highly dimensional. There are different approximations that we can do and different uh, tricks and tweaks that, that can make it work. <coughs> Excuse me, a little bit faster. Um, there are different uh, algorithms that use these kinds of tree models. Uh, Comic algorithm that I just showed, Mimic algorithm proposed by De Monet, and uh, the BMDA algorithm that we have proposed a little bit later, which uses forest models. But basically all of these algorithms, I would have to say, that do about the same thing. They encode context of one bit, they do it with, uh, with a little bit different measures, they use different types of trees, really, but they're still doing kind of the same thing. And as far as the applicability goes and the power of these algorithms goes, uh, it will be about the same. Uh, if we want to go beyond these uh, pairwise probabilities, uh, by the way, there, there was work which showed that these types of tree models are not going to solve me my trap problems and the general order k decomposable problems where I need statistics of higher order. They're not going to be a general solution because in traps, for example, I really do need to take into account context of all other four bits or all other k minus one bits because if I don't do that, the averages are still going to lead in the wrong direction. And I can create those types of problems where I really do need context of much more bits than one bit. All right. <clears throat> Uh, one of the algorithms that goes beyond, beyond those pairwise statistics and which tries to take into account statistics over subsets of bits, bigger subsets of bits than two, is the extended compact genetic algorithm which was proposed by George Herrick in 1999. And the basic idea is to use those kinds of models that I showed earlier in our example where things would look like a probability vector but instead of single bits, we would take into account subsets of bits. So for each subset of bits, we would have a bunch of probabilities. We would have a probability table, which would encode all of those different instantiations of those subsets of bits. And we would encode the probabilities of those subsets of bits, those proportions, right? And then I would generate new strings by generating one subset at a time. And I would set the values based on these tables, based on these proportions something like proportion and selection kind of thing. Uh, to learn a model in ECGA, and we have seen how this kind of a model can be used, but the big question is, of course, how do I learn that kind of a model? How do I find out where those subsets are? And that's a very important part, which is going to take me from that sheet model, which I designed myself by hand, to an algorithm which can actually learn those kinds of models. So I want to find out how those subsets should really be distributed. And to do that, extended compact genetic algorithm uses a very simple greedy approach where it would start with a probability vector where every single bit is going to be a subset, subset of, it, of, of, of its own, excuse me. And then it starts merging these subsets by always merging two of the subsets together. And it keeps doing this until we find out that the model is good enough that any more merge operators would not actually improve our models. So I find out that if I put these two groups together, I'm no longer getting a better model. Now to 
do this, what we need to have is some kind of a measure which is going to tell me uh, if I make subsets of this form and if I make subsets of this form, which one of those two things is going to be better. Right? I need to have some kind of fitness function which is going to tell me, well, these kinds of subsets are better than these kinds of subsets. And to decide on that, we can use a me measure which is very similar to my mutual information measure. And it's going to be uh, the so-called MDL metric, minimum description length metric, which is going to be composed of two things. One of the things is going to encode the description length of the model, which is going to be, in simple terms, the number of bits that I do need to encode all probabilities in the model. And the second thing that I'm going to have is the description length of my calculation, which is going to be decreased if my model encodes enough regularities about the problem. So that will be how many bits do I need to store the population using the model that I actually am <coughs> assuming here. And these two things are going to go against each other. The uh, population complexity or data complexity is going to decrease as I make the model more complex, as I add more and more bits in my subsets. And it's going to be actually perfect, in most cases at least, if um, my subset includes all the bits. Then my model description complexity is going to grow very quickly as I add more bits into any subset. It's going to always increase exponentially for that subset because I have to encode twice as many probabilities if I add just one more bit into my subset, right? So it's going to grow very quickly with the size of subsets and it's going to kind of push the models to be simple. And somewhere in between there will be a compromise where the model is going to look good enough to me. Now, once we have that model, just like in the example that I showed earlier, we would go through those subsets of bits and we would sample one subset at a time using those proportions that I observed in the, the selected solutions. Right? Uh, one of the things that we can do with the model, and I'm going to try to stress this, uh, this issue a little bit later too, but one of the things I can do with the model is actually design better mutation operators or better local search operators as well. Because what the model really tells me is that, well, this bit really depends on those other bits. And I better not deal with this bit independently of those other bits. So if I have a subset of bits, it really tells me kind of a chunk of bits where I should not take one of those bits out of this subset because I'm going to ignore some important context. And therefore, if I want to do effective local search, I should probably try to change those subsets of bits at a time instead of changing just one of them. And if I do mutation, I should probably change these groups of bits at a time instead of changing just one of those bits independently of others, right? So this model actually provides me with much more than just effective way to basically do crossover by sample <coughs> But it actually tells me a lot about the problem. And I can use that knowledge about the problem to actually uh, make efficient local search methods, for example. And if we do this well, we can actually gain speed ups on separable problems as well. But I don't want to get into too much detail here. Anyway, so we saw three types of models. We saw the probability vector, which is the first and simplest example. We see three models. Uh, where we have some dependencies, we can take into account context of one bit for each single bit, and we saw uh, ECGA models where uh, the models could be called marginal product models, where we look at subsets of bits and we to take probabilities of those subsets of bits. And the next thing is going to be Bayesian networks. Uh, at Bayesian network, is a model, and Bayesian networks are going to be able to encode all of these models that we have seen so far. They're more complex class of models, a little bit more difficult to talk about, but I'll try. Anyway, a uh, Bayesian network is defined by a cyclic directed graph, which uh, where, where the nodes denote the different variables in the problem, or the different string positions, or different bits, we can say. And the dependencies between those variables will be represented by directed edges. And those directed edges are going to encode direct conditional dependencies. So for this example, I would say that this string position depends on those other two bits. Right? 
for every bit, I'm going to be able to specify some subset of bits from which the edges are going to point into my bit, which are going to basically denote my context in the terminology that I used earlier. They're going to denote the context on which my good value of the good value of this bit actually depends. Now, one restriction on these models is, is going to be that these models are um, acyclic. And that's going to be because of the easier sampling of these models, but we have dependency networks where I do not have this restriction, and it's a little bit more complicated case in, 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 in the case of Bayesian networks. Uh, but I'm going to assume that the models are going to be acyclic. Right? Um, the basic algorithm is the same as what we talked about before. Uh, we work with a population of points, we work with selection operator, we would select good points. For those good points, I would learn my Bayesian network. I would not only learn what my conditional probabilities would be for that Bayesian network, for those conditional dependencies, but I would also learn where to put the edges. I would learn the full Bayesian network, including the structure and parameters of that network. And then once I have the network, I would sample the network to generate new points, right? So the same idea, just to refresh our memory, the same idea as before, just we have to find out how to learn the Bayesian networks and how to sample the Bayesian networks. To learn the Bayesian networks, we have again two things, just like in ECGA and just like in the tree models. We have to um, have some kind of a, a scoring metric which lets me decide which kind of a structure is better. So if I put edges in my network in this way or if I put edges in this network in this way, which one of those two options is going to be better. And I have to have some, some way of finding out how to walk through the space of all possible networks and based on that scoring metric, how am I going to actually figure out which one of those networks is the best one for me. Now, there are different types of scoring metrics that we may use. There are two basic approaches. One of them is based on Bayesian statistics, and this is one of my favorite equations because it looks complicated and I usually don't have much to say about it. And uh, the minimum description length based metric, which again does the same thing. And both of these metrics can be shown to be equivalent for big data sets but they actually do behave quite differently for small data sets. And there is a lot of work which compares these and discusses advantages or disadvantages. I'm not going to do that here. For now, these are the fitness functions which let us choose between the different structures. Uh, as a search pr procedure, we will typically use a greedy algorithm. And even though this algorithm is not guaranteed to actually find the globally optimal patient network, it's uh, very quick. And it typically finds a really good patient network. And that's why pretty much all of the people that use patient networks, they would use a greedy algorithm to learn the networks. And the basic idea of the algorithm is that just like in ECGA and just like in the com commit algorithm in three models, we would start with a model which uh, takes every variable independently of all other variables and we would keep, keep adding edges into the network that would seem to be the best choice. We would really look at all the possible edges that we can add and we would add the best guy. And we would do it again and again until we find out that there is no way to improve the models anymore. So we start with a probability vector model where everything is independent of everything else. And we would look at all possible edges that we can add, and we would just add the best one. So this is the best guy in this case. And we would do it again, and again, and again. And eventually we find out that uh, no additional edge can improve my network more, or I may decide that the model is actually complex enough, and I don't want to get any more complex models. So I might have some parameters that restrict my model complexity, which are going to stop me from making the model more complex. We can add more operators. So in this case, we can also add operator which reverses an edge or which deletes some of the edges, which actually might be useful in some cases. We did not find it very useful. Uh, it helped a little bit, but it was really not for the extra work. That's what I would say. Anyway, uh, if you want to find the exact, and it, uh, it becomes not so easy to talk about the exact relationship with, with, between how the problem would look like 
and how the network should look like to actually be able to guarantee that I solve the problem. Uh, we are no longer limited to types of problems like concatenated traps where I have some independent sub-problems of small order. We can actually solve much more with Bayesian networks. But it's not so easy to actually define it. If you want to look at the definition, it, it's done with the um, graph theory results and it can be found actually in this paper and that defines actually um, if the fitness function looks like this, then we can actually in these cases prove that this Bayesian network is going to solve me the problem. It's not proving that I'm going to find that network, but it's proving that if I use that kind of a network, I can provably find the global optimum. It's uh, the kind of, kind of worst case scenario because it does not say that in other cases it's not going to happen and in many other cases it's going to still happen. Just like with the probability vector, I'm going to still solve many problems where the context does matter, but it does matter in a good way. It's not going to lead things in the wrong direction. Right? Anyway, but we can show that if the problem is decomposable into subproblems of bounded order, just like it was the case for concatenated traps and similar problems, we can use facet-wise theory, which simplifies the situation a little bit. But it actually provides us very accurate models, and I'm going to show how the theoretical results match um, empirical results. It can help us to estimate how big populations we would need and how many generations we would need to solve the problem. And with these results, we can try to find out if we have met the challenge and if we were able to propose an algorithm that actually is able to find that context in reasonable time. Right? Because at this point, I know that I have a class of models that should solve me the problem, but I don't really know if I don't need exponential population size to do that. Right? I don't know if I don't need some infinite number of generations to solve the problem. Right? So it's important to find some kind of bounds which are going to help me to find out, well, how fast is it going to work if I do it this way. And the facet-wise population sizing theory decomposes the problem of sizing the population into four facets. First of all, if I have a problem decomposable into subproblems or statistics of some small bounded order, I better make sure that initially I have all instances of all those subproblems. So if I wanted to solve a trap, I need to make sure that for all those subsets of five bits, I need to have all instances of five bits. If I don't have them initially, my probabilistic model is not going to be able to make them up. Right? So that's the first thing. And that would be, it's a very simplified model, something like 2 to the k times log of the problem size, actually. Uh, the second thing that I have to make sure is that if I, um, in, in, imagine we are doing a tournament selection in a population of, of points, and if we focus on one of those track functions, I know that 1, 1, 1, 1, 1 should be better on average than 0, 0, 0, 0, 0. But I also know that my fitness is not going to be influenced by, by just these five bits, but it's also going to be influenced by all other bits. And if I want to make sure that my proportion actually moves in the right direction towards 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, I'm going to have to make sure that my population is big enough that this other stuff will average out. And that's what decision model, uh, decision making model actually talks about. And we get something out of it. Drift model talks about something like a delayed initial supply. If I have a problem which I can decompose into bounded order statistics, but I know that they are scaled very differently, and at some point only some subproblems will matter, and the others will matter so little that they really will not come into play in selection at all until late generations, I have to make sure that I preserve those alternative partial solutions until then, until selection starts to actually take into account those very unimportant subproblems, but also subproblems that matter. And that's the drift model or domino convergence model. And uh, finally, we need to make sure that we build an accurate model. We need to make sure that my model is going to store those important contexts or those important statistics that I do need to solve the problem. And that's yet another facet. If we put all these facets together, we see that this is the fastest growing thing, so we should get something like n to the 105 growth of population size. 
As far as the number of generations goes, we can use models which were developed for simple, simpler algorithms and simpler problems, and we will take two extreme cases. First of all, if I have a decomposable problem, all subproblems can matter about the same. They can all be on about the same scale, fitness values wise. And that would be the case for one max, or that would be the case for concatenated traps. For these problems, basically all my bits converge at the same time. All of them converge uh, in parallel. And in that case, we can estimate an upper bound for the number of generations to be a square root of the problem size. And the other extreme is when my subproblems are scaled so differently that until one subproblem converges, nobody else really matters as much. You can imagine a binary integer problem instead of one max. The first bit, the most significant bit, matters more than any other bit. And until I converge with that bit, no other bits are really going to take place in selection at all. And I have to converge with one bit before the others are going to start playing the game. And then I have to converge with the other bit, and I sequentially converge from the most, uh, most uh, significant problem to the least significant problem, which gives me something like a linear convergence time. Altogether, if I put these things together, uh, we are going to have uh, these bounds for the population size and the number of generations. And we put these two things together, multiply them, I get a bound on the number of evaluations, and it gives me a quadratic number of valuations or better. Which means that we have met the challenge. We were able to design an algorithm, and I don't want to say that Boa is the only guy that does that, right? ECGA can do that as well, and we can design similar theory for ECGA as well. These algorithms that take into account multivariate statistics <coughs> or multivariate contexts are able to solve problems that we can decompose into subproblems of bounded order, and they're able to do it very quickly in, uh, in time where the order of my polynomial does not really depend on my order of subproblems. And we would beat many other algorithms that I showed earlier and I don't want to come back to. Here is, I said that we have to make many approximations. It's very difficult to model and uh, most of you which uh, have seen some theory of standard simple genetic algorithms know that it's very difficult to actually model even simple genetic algorithms with, say, uniform crossover. It's even more difficult to model EDAs when you learn a new model in every iteration and your crossover operator really changes in every single, oper in, in, in every single iteration. It's very difficult to find rigorous theoretical models. And we have made many assumptions but still, the match between theory and experiment is very nice, right? So this is how the number of evaluations grows with problem size, and we see that what we would kind of expect actually is happening. There are other algorithms based on Bayesian networks, uh, <coughs> estimation of Bayesian networks algorithm, and the learning factorized distribution algorithm. Uh, there are other multivariate models that we may use. One of them is uh, Markov networks, which use undirected graphs, and the sampling becomes a little bit of an issue. And the other one are the so-called dependency networks that I mentioned earlier, which look like Bayesian networks, but we do not assume uh, that the graph is a cycle. And the sampling, again, becomes uh, somewhat of an issue. But we can really map between these classes of models quite easily, and in most, most cases, there are many more. If you look at the scale of models that we have looked at, uh, three models are the simplest ones. Somewhere over here, we would have the probability vector, of course, which is the most simple one. And ECGA is more complex one. And the most complex ones would be the Bayesian networks, Markov networks, and dependency networks. Of course, uh, the more complex model we use, the more difficult problems we should be able to solve. Because we are able to, with Bayesian networks, we are able to learn all kinds of models that ECGA can learn and more. So we should be able probably to solve at least as many problems as ECGA can. But typically, you have to spend also more time in building the model and sampling the model. right? So everything comes at a price. And if I know that my problem could be solved with the probability vector, I should probably do that, right? Or if I know that uh, 
three models are going to be enough, I should probably do that. Right? So always things come at a price. Uh, one of the questions is, well, uh, these kinds of algorithms can, uh, can solve me problems where I can decompose the problem into sub-problems of bounded order, like those subsets of bits of some relatively small order. Now the question is, uh, question is, can I actually take it farther and can I solve even more complex problems? And I can actually do that and I can solve problems which cannot be actually decomposed into sub-problems of any bounded order and I can do that by using the approach that we often use in, uh, in human problem solving and engineering as well. And the basic idea <coughs> is to solve problem hierarchically and to decompose the problem on multiple levels of difficulty. So I would, uh, and I usually use the design of a car as an example. So I can split up the design of car into multiple systems. I could look up at the design of engine, braking system, electrical system, and so on and so forth. And I could look at these sub-problems almost independently. And I could work on the design of engines without really caring about the engineers who are working on the braking system. These systems are um, almost independent. <coughs> and I could still decompose those systems on the next level. And I could go all the way down and that's the approach that we very often times use in engineering and design and so on and so forth. Now, if I wanted to incorporate that into my problem solver, what I would like to do is uh, decompose the problem on multiple levels of difficulty, and I would like to solve the problem from the lowest level, where I break up the problem into the kind of shortest sub-problems or smallest <coughs> sub-problems. Then I would like to find some alternative solutions to those small sub-problems, and I would like to compose those most promising solutions to compose solutions of bigger order. And those bigger order solutions on the next level, those would be my engines and braking systems and whatever, I would try to, again, try to find several alternatives that look the best, and I would like to compose those to, to form even bigger order solutions on the next level. And I would like to increase the order of my solutions as I go up a number of levels. <clears throat> to succeed in doing this, uh, what I can do, I can, uh, I can define what's most important to actually succeed at doing this. And we identify three important things that I have to do to ensure that I'm going to solve the problems, so solve the problems on uh, multiple levels of difficulty. Uh, first of all, I have to make sure that on each level of difficulty I'm going to break up the problem uh, well and I'm going to uh, create sub-problems that actually uh, provide a good enough decomposition on that level. I need to make sure that I'm able to represent uh, high order partial solutions efficiently because as I go up a number of levels I'm going to get partial solutions of relatively hard, large order and I have to have an efficient way to deal with these high order solutions and, and there are many instances of those. And finally, I need to make sure that as I go up a number of levels, I preserve different <coughs> alternative partial solutions so that I have enough stuff to combine solutions on higher levels. And to do this, we can mod modify BOA, uh, the Bayesian optimization algorithm in uh, these ways. First of all, to deal with decomposition, I can use the Bayesian approach that we have used before. To deal with efficient representation of local structures, uh, of, of uh, not local structures, of partial solutions, we can use local structures in Bayesian networks. And to deal with preservation of alternative solutions, I can use my favorite niching method of genetic algorithms. In this case, we decided to use restricted tournament replacement. First thing that we can, uh, I was probably not standing there, but anyway, uh, the first thing that we need to do is, as we, if, if you look at Bayesian networks themselves, and if we think about solving the problem hierarchically, and if we think about getting to those uh, statistics of very high order, in Bayesian networks we need to store conditional probabilities of, of that order. And uh, the complexity of tables for storing those conditional probabilities grows exponentially fast with the order of those probabilities. Now, that means that I'm going to have a big problem representing these things on higher levels. And that means that I need to find a better way to represent these conditional probability tables. And uh, one thing I can do is instead of, say, say I have a first string position and I know that uh, it depends on the second and third string position, 
the Bayesian network will have to encode me a conditional probability table uh, for those variables which may look just like this, for example. But instead of using that full conditional probability table, what I can do is use more advanced structures like decision trees, for example. And I can, for example, in this case, encode something like this. Well, I know that x1 depends on x2 and x3. But I know that if x2 is 1, uh, the probability of x1 no, no longer depends on x3. Right? So I can find out that in some context, actually, only some variables matter. Right? And I can reduce the number of those probabilities that I actually have to store very significantly. And you can imagine how this can uh, change things if I look at, say, five parents or ten parents. And actually, it can completely change the structure of the tree. And I can find out that I depend on x2, x3, and x7 only if all of them are one. Otherwise, I depend on x4, and so on and so forth. Right? So I can really encode complicated things with these decision trees. And uh, in restricted tournament replacement, it's just a niching strategy. It doesn't have anything to do with uh, PMBGAs. It's a niching strategy that tries to ensure that I preserve alternative solutions over time effectively so that I do not uh, slow down convergence too much. But at the same time, I make sure that I maintain multiple alternatives, <coughs> right? So I don't try to focus on in, in one direction in the search space. Now, the basic idea of restricted tournament replacement is to take my new solutions and incorporate those new solutions with the following procedure into the original population. First of all, I would uh, pick a random subset of points in the original <coughs> population of points. Then out of this subset of points, I would select the one that is most similar to my new guy. Then I would compare the fitness values of the two. And if the new guy is better, or at least as good, it would replace the old guy. Otherwise, it would not replace him. Now, the basic idea is that I'm going to replace similar guys with similar guys, which means that I'm going to kind of create implicit niches in the population. And I'm always going to try to uh, keep different alternatives, right? So solutions with many ones are typically going to replace solutions with many ones, and that's going to make me preserve solutions with fewer ones, right? So that's kind of the basic idea. And by doing this, I'm going to be able to solve problems which are hierarchical, which are decomposable, but over multiple levels of difficulty. And where I can actually show that we cannot decompose these problems on a single level into those sub-problems of bounded order. And I cannot solve them with this one cheat model that I showed at the beginning, which would take into account some bounded subsets of variables. Right? So I'm going to actually be able to show that I cannot solve these problems in that way. And one of those example problems looks very similar to my concatenated traps, but instead it's going to be called hierarchical trap, and it's going to combine multiple traps on multiple levels. And the basic idea will be to apply something like a concatenated traps on the lowest level, then map those groups of bits to a higher level. Always a group of bits of zeros would map to a zero. Group of bits uh, of ones, of all ones, would map to a one. And uh, anything else would map, say, to a null symbol. And I would map them to the next level. And I would apply trap function on the next level as well. Right? And I could have a much bigger tree, and I would basically apply traps on the lowest level. Then I would map those subsets of bits to a higher level. I would again apply deceptive traps, and I would map it to a higher level, and I would apply traps in this hierarchical manner. And if I do that, I create a problem which I cannot decompose into subproblem of bounded order. And I don't want to spend too much time on these functions, that's why I just gave the basic idea. But you, you would notice that any kind of a fixed model that you can design is not just going to work. And if you increase the problem size, those models are going to actually break. But HWA is able to solve those problems, and we see that the performance is, again, subquadratic just like for the standard BOA, and there is a uh, simple theory that would support this. That's the, uh, that's a fit that is very close to the theoretical model. Anyway, uh, important point that I, uh, this is one of the new slides, actually. So, important point that I did not used to talk about enough, I think, is that when I solve a problem with a PMPGA, it does not really just find me the optimum. It actually gives me a lot more. It gives me a sequence of probabilistic models, 
that very closely correspond to my fitness landscape. It gives me a sequence of models where I know that initial models are very close to uniform distribution of points, but they put a slight emphasis of high quality solutions. I know that the latest models actually encode me probably something very close to the distribution of the global optimum. Right? So I know that I have these sequences of models which encode me a lot of information about the problem. So the PMBGA, besides giving you good solutions, it gives you a lot of information about the problem. Now, you can use this information in different ways. You can, for example, design a problem-specific searcher, and you can find out that, well, anytime I apply a PMBGA to this type of a problem, I find out that the problem has this structure. So I can design a specific crossover operator which is going to exploit this structure. I can design a specific local searcher that is going to exploit that structure. I can uh, use these kinds of methods to improve my exact methods like branch and bound or whatever other methods. I can actually use these models in multiple ways because they give me information about the problem that I definitely do not get from standard genetic algorithms and many other algorithms. So, so that's definitely an important uh, point and uh, one of the big questions of today's research is actually how to use this information to actually design problem specific methods, to, to design better hybrid methods, to design various efficiency enhancement techniques and so on. Uh, <coughs> even if we can solve problems in a quadratic time, even if I uh, can uh, solve problems in maybe near linear time, this oftentimes is not going to be enough. Imagine you have a problem where you have a million of variables or a billion of variables. Uh, imagine a problem where one thickness evaluation would take one hour. In those cases, if I have quadratic performance and I need to perform millions of evaluations, I'm just not going to be able to solve the problem. And in those cases, what I need to do, and that's what many practitioners have done, they use various efficiency enhancement techniques and they either parallelize the approach or they uh, use different types of hybrids or they try to do all kinds of tricks and tweaks so that they make the algorithm actually run faster. And that's uh, one of the important areas for estimation of distribution algorithms and I think that it's actually one of the most important areas for future research that actually very strongly relates to this. The information that we get from the model provided by PMBGAs <coughs> can help me a lot in designing good techniques to make things run faster. And if you look at PMBGAs, they, uh, there are different types of uh, techniques that we can use to enhance efficiency of these methods. For example, we can parallelize them we can uh, create hybrid methods with, with all kinds of local searchers or problem specific methods or exact methods. We can exploit the uh, time continuation trade-offs such as uh, do I run my algorithm with a small population for multiple epochs or do I run it with a big population for one epoch. Uh, I can uh, use fitness evaluation relaxation where I would replace my expensive fitness with some simple but inaccurate model of the fitness and I can actually use the probabilistic model to design a better model of fitness because uh, it gives me information about the problem landscape and in that case what I need to know is when I should actually use the inaccurate but inexpensive model of fitness and when I should actually use the expensive fitness which is accurate but very slow. I can uh, incorporate prior knowledge about the problem. So for example, I can know that uh, probably the first and seventh variables are related and I can actually encode this and I can make my algorithm to bias the search for models so that this dependency will be included. Or I can say that it's very unlikely that there is zero in position one and seven, and I can incorporate this information into my learning of those conditional probabilities. So I can incorporate all kinds of prior knowledge about the problem. I can uh, build models a little bit uh, more efficiently by uh, using the previously learned models as the starting point and not always starting from scratch, so only updating my network structures incrementally. I can also use previous network structures without changing them for a number of generations and only update structures sometimes. That's actually going to help a lot. 
and I can try to learn from experience where I can uh, solve, say, many maximum satisfiability problems, and I can analyze how those probability models look like, and I can use this knowledge to solve future instances of the same class faster. So I'm going to probably learn that in my probabilistic models, the variables that were in the same clause were usually connected by an edge in the network. Right? So that knowledge is going to help me to restrict my class of models significantly and I can actually reduce the time that I have to spend in building the model significantly. Uh, we can use the <coughs> we can use the multi-objective approaches uh, developed for standard genetic algorithms for uh, for probabilistic model building genetic algorithms and we would use basically the same approaches we could incorporate the NSGA2 uh, approach to deterministic crowding and the non-dominated selection and we could create multi-objective HOAs and multi-objective ECGAs and multi-objective whatever EDA we could incorporate the methods from SPIA2, which are the two very good multi-objective algorithms, and really this only changes the selection and replacement strategies. It does not really change the core component, which is the model building, right? That always remains the same thing. In fact, if I do have the model for multi-objective problems, it might actually help me to better understand the trade-off that I'm going to actually obtain in the objective space because I'm going to have a probabilistic model that encodes those solutions and I might be able to um, find better methods for exploring the, the trade-off curve. Uh, I'm going to show some example applications but I'm going to jump through this quality quickly. Actually, let me check my time. Oh. Okay, I'm going to definitely jump through it quickly. Uh, there are a bunch of artificial types of problems. We saw concatenated 5-bit traps. That's the result that we saw. We saw the uh, hierarchical traps. Uh, there are problems from physics, which have been successfully solved. Spin glasses was one of the favorite problems where we would look at the 2D, 3D, or even SK spin glass instances, and we would solve those with probabilistic model in GAs. And what you could see is actually models that would closely correspond to the structure of the problem that you defined. And they would closely correspond to what a physicist would actually think that the models would look like. Uh, there is an application of PMBGAs to silicon cluster optimization with three body potentials. <coughs> Here are the results for the 2D spin class where we see a nice polynomial performance. Which actually, and this was interesting about this result, uh, that the matched performance of the best problem specific method which used analytical solution to the problem and they matched it with a PMPGA which actually did not assume any knowledge about the problem. Right? So the same algorithm that we would use for solving concatenated traps and all other kinds of problems was able to match performance of the best analytical method available to up to now. So that was that's what this slide is talking about. Anyway, we can go to 3D spin glasses where the problem is NP complete, but the performance is only slightly faster than, uh, slower than polynomial. We can look at ST spin glass, and I have a talk uh, later in this deco, I think tomorrow, about ST spin glasses. And here's the result. The results on maximum satisfiability, feature subset selection, and so on and so forth. Um, I put a list of some other applications, and I uh, for some years I tried to make this list complete, I'm not trying that anymore, I just sometimes add one more thing and delete one thing, but uh, there are a number of other applications that you can actually find in literature where they use these algorithms successfully. To summarize, if you look at the different PMBGAs that we have seen so far, we looked at uh, different types of models, and that's what really uh, discriminate uh, that, that's what really was different about these different PMBGAs. And if we looked at uh, uh, the applications, if I, was, if I was to suggest you which of these PMBGAs you should use in practice, 
All I would say is what I said earlier. If you have an easy problem that you can solve with simple models, you should probably do it. If you have a, a more difficult problems where the context of one bit would be enough to solve the problem, you should probably use three models. And as the problems become more difficult, you should probably use more and more difficult models. Uh, one thing you can do is just basically try to continue in this way and increase complexity of models and find out if you're getting any better solutions. Another thing that you can do is just use the most complicated algorithm and just maybe spend some more time solving the problem if the problem really was easy, right? But the basic idea is this, the more complex the problem, the more complex class of models we should really use. I'm not going to have too much time to talk about other representations, but I'm going to say a few words about it. Uh, if you look at the uh, real valued problems, and there was a tutorial which actually related to this yesterday on, uh, on CMAES and related EDAs. But the basic new challenge that we have in this domain is that our solution space is infinite. And it's going to be much more difficult to actually find kinds of regularities that we were looking for in the discrete space. It's going to be much more difficult to find uh, what vari variables depend on other variables and it's going to become much more difficult to store those local dependencies, those local distributions that we only could use uh, conditional probability tables. We cannot really do that in the continuous domain. It's a much more complicated problem. And there are two basic approaches that we could use. First of all, we could uh, discretize our real valued problem map it into a binary string or a string over some higher order alphabet and we could apply one of those discrete PMBGAs. So we could apply ECGA or UMDA, any of those discrete PMBGAs or we could try to create directly a model for the real valued variables which would include some PDFs and some mixtures of PDFs and, and uh, these kinds of distributions. And then, first approach to doing this was to use something like a probability vector, but instead of looking at the probability of a 1, we would have a Gaussian for each of the variables. Right? And this Gaussian would be always centered around the mean of the selected points. And the, the initial approach that I'm showing here, the deviations for the different Gaussians would actually be equal, and they would be decreasing over time based on the user-defined schedule. I think they would be multiplied by 0.9 or something. Uh, so the basic distribution that we would see is this uh, multivariate Gaussian with uh, no covariance and with the, with the same variance in all different directions. One of the improvements to this method was to uh, change the variances of different variables or allow different variables to have different variants which allow, would, would allow us to basically squeeze the distribution of the axes. I'm sorry for the non-mathematic terms here. But anyway, so that's one thing that I can do. do. One thing I can do is add a covariance and, and, and I can actually allow those distributions to turn around and explore linear relationships between the different variables. And I can actually start using mixture distributions, like kernel distributions, where I would put a Gaussian around each point, for example, and my overall distribution is going to be able to look much more complex. It's going to be able to encode a much more complex landscape where I would be able to kind of explore multiple basins basis of attraction at the same time. Because in this case, I'm basically looking at kind of one peak. In this case, I'm going to be able to explore multiple basins of attraction at the same time, and this is pretty much like a standard evolution strategy. That's, that's what standard evolution strategy basically does. And uh, there are many places in between these. If I don't put a Gaussian around each point, but I just decide to have seven Gaussians, I can decide to have seven Gaussian distributions and I can create a mixture distribution out of them. I can create a mixture distribution over all the variables, or I can look at mixture distributions over some subsets of variables or single variables, and I can create products of these distributions, and I have actually quite a large space of distributions to deal with here. And there are many approaches that actually try to do this, and here are some citations along the way that you can use as starting points. 
uh, one of the other approaches that we can use for uh, real value distributions is to create models which actually can deal with uh, different types of variables, like both the discrete variables and continuous variables. And uh, you remember those decision trees that store conditional probabilities for every variable. We can just incorporate real value variables into those decision trees as well. But instead of asking whether a variable is equal to 0 or 1, those would be the subtrees. In this case, I would ask if the variable is bigger than something or smaller than something. And that would create me subtrees of a real value variable in a decision tree. And if I had a leaf or a real value variable, I could use some kernel distribution, for example, to encode those local distributions. And that would allow me to have a model which is very similar to discretization. <laughs> And it's kind of a crossover of the discretization or discrete EDAs and the BOA kind of model. I really don't have time to talk about it too much. Uh, we can create uh, directly real coded variants of BOA and other algorithms by designing models which look like Bayesian networks just instead of conditional probability tables. I would have mixtures of bounded order. So that, that's one of the approaches that does this. And there are other approaches which are based on uh, techniques from machine learning that actually could be used. Uh, we can use uh, ins inspiration from ant colonies where we can uh, decide that our solutions will be something like ants and they will be leaving pheromones where they actually are. The good solutions will leave more pheromones and the final distributions will be mixture distributions based on the pheromone distribution that we actually obtain over time. Uh, one of the important directions, and I'm so, sorry for making this quick jump through these slides, I probably should probably skip some, but anyway, one of the important topics is the variance scaling, and uh, this is an old problem from evolution strategies where um, at the beginning when we search for the optimum, we would probably like to have a very high variance of, of uh, my distribution that I use to change solutions or generate solutions. And as I continue the search, I would probably like to decrease that variance, but not really too fast, so that I actually continue toward the optimum, but not too slow, so that I don't keep jumping too randomly when I get close to the optimum. Close to the optimum. And uh, this is the same problem in this case. And we want to make sure that if we create those probabilistic models for real value spaces, that we actually keep variances the way that ensures that my search is uh, Okay, um, we can uh, also, as I said, we can use the standard discretization approaches that can be used <coughs> standard genetic algorithms as well. And uh, there are multiple ways to do that. We can use fixed types of models. We can use adaptive models, which actually change over time. Um, and uh, in this case, the advantage is that we can just use those discrete PMBGAs, and of course the question is uh, how well it works, but I think that using adaptive models with, uh, with discrete EDAs is actually quite a good idea, and I think we are going to have a talk on that at the OBUPM workshop by Pierre Lutalanzi. Um, in summary, we can use discretization, which can be fixed or adaptive, or we can use real value models where we have models with single peak or multiple peaks, we have models with uh, uh, different variants for different variables or the same variants for all variables, we have models with covariance or no covariance, we can use uh, mixture distributions, we can uh, treat an entire vector as one single chunk or we can decompose the problem and model the continuous distribution of the sub-problems independently. We can do all these kinds of things and really um, if you were to ask me which thing is the best, it would really depend on how the problem looks like. So if my problem is highly multimodal, I would probably suggest using a distribution that allows me to encode multiple peaks, some mixture distribution of some form. If the problem can be decomposed, it's definitely useful to decompose the problem and model those sub-problems independently because it reduces dimensionality very strongly. If there are strong linear dependencies in the problem and I want to walk in the space on some complicated curves, 
in that case, I would definitely like to include covariance, even though if the problem does not need this, it's going to cost me a little bit to use it. And if the problem is partially differentiable, for example, I would probably want to use a hybrid, and I would probably want to include a good local searcher, which would actually improve the, the, the points locally to a local optimum. There are also approaches that try to deal with even more complicated uh, representations like uh, programs of genetic programming. And uh, there are, of course, completely new challenges. We get to programs of genetic programming. We get structures which are more complex structures. We have to deal with solutions which are trees, labeled trees. Those labels can actually be real values or discrete labels, so we have all kinds of labels that we talked about. Uh, these solutions do not have some uh, fixed structure, they do not have some fixed size, so these are the new challenges that we have to deal with. And let me just show one of the basic approaches, the first approach that was actually proposed. That, was, that, one, that one was called pipe, where we would decide on some maximum tree that we would be able to generate. And then for each node in that tree, we would store the probabilities of the different functions and terminals that we could actually observe in that node of the tree. So for example, for the root of the tree, we would find out that the sine function is there 15% of time, plus is there 35% of time, and so on and so forth. And then when we would generate new trees, we would start at the root of the tree, and we would first generate the, the label of the root of the tree, and then depending on how many arguments we need, we would continue lower to the tree. And we would grow the tree with those probability tables, and we would have that kind of a probability table in every single node. It's kind of a probability vector based genetic programming, because we take every node to be independent of every other node. Another thing important to notice here is that we uh, model each node um, as, as a node of a fixed position, right? We cannot encode that uh, the left argument of sine function should probably be plus. We cannot really encode that. We take every node independently and we wouldn't encode any kind of regularity that would kind of move in the tree. We always fix everything to a specific position in the tree. We can uh, design models that look more like ECGA. So we would take kind of subsets of nodes and encode tables for those. Just similar idea. We can go all the way to create much more complicated approaches. I think that this is worth looking at. There's a thesis available on this, which was published not too long ago. And uh, if you want to think about these things, it's probably a good place to start. Actually, there are a few other things that I could suggest to be involved. Uh, one other thing uh, that we can do when we talk about genetic programming is to evolve grammars that are going to encode the distribution over probabilistic uh, distribution over the trees in general, the genetic programming trees. So I can encode grammars, I can uh, put the probability to different grammar rules, and I can uh, then generate new trees with those grammars, right? So that's another approach that I could actually use, which might be used in some contexts. In general, the use of uh, probabilistic models, explicit probabilistic models in genetic programming is, is a very complex issue, and I think that more research is still needed in this area, certainly. It's very complicated to get, uh, get very positive and generally applicable results. Anyway, we can also look at PMBGS for permutations and all kinds of other representations. Permutations are one of the popular representations because they're the basis for the QAP problem or uh, traveling salesman problem. So, so it's a very popular representation and uh, there are many approaches to do this. But let me just jump to conclusions so that I actually have time for some questions. Uh, the bottom line of this talk is that uh, a number of uh, powerful algorithms based on explicit modeling of good solutions and sampling those models to generate new solutions exist. 
they're ready for application, and they can actually solve many problems that we could not solve previously, and they can do it without requiring the user to actually tweak representation or tweak operators. They're actually able to kind of design their operators by themselves just by looking at the points that have been generated and looking at the evaluations of those points. And that's a very important point that I try to make here. I also try to stress that they do not only solve us optimization problem, they actually tell us a lot about the problem itself. So they actually tell us how the problem landscape looks like and they tell us a lot about the features of this problem landscape and the structure of the landscape where I can say that this bit depends on that context is just one thing. It actually gives me also probabilities which tell me how many bases basins of attraction I have, for example, which might be even useful to find out how big these basins of attraction are. There's all kind of work that we can imagine of uh, creating based on the information encoded by the probabilistic models. And uh, I think that these methods should be incredibly useful for practitioners who have difficult problems but who probably do not want to play around too much and who probably don't want to create a new representation for every single problem that they're trying to solve, who don't want to create a specific crossover operator or read 500 papers on genetic algorithms to decide that this specific crossover and this specific mutation and this specific selection probably should work in my case. For those people, this is a very useful method because these methods are very broadly applicable as they can adapt to the problem themselves. <coughs> anyway, so um, in the list of slides, you can look at some starting points. You can look at some uh, look, look at some links to the code. So let me close it for now, and I'll be open to any questions. Or, or.